Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Dr. Eric Russell as we continue our weekly servant leadership discussions. This week, we explore foresight and servant leadership. Dr. Eric Russell, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Great to be here. I'm excited to meet with you again and continue our weekly servant leadership discussion series as we explore the different aspects, the different principles, the different characteristics of servant leadership. Today, we're going to continue our discussion uh, by exploring the concept and the characteristic of foresight as it relates to servant leadership. Uh, For those of you who are listening who may not have caught the previous episodes in this series, uh, Dr. Russell and I have been meeting weekly, probably now for about a month and a half, to discuss different um, different servant leadership uh, principles. And uh, it's been really great to, to go through these uh, topics with him. Dr. Eric Russell is uh, an associate professor of emergency services at Utah Valley University, and he's an HCI research associate. Uh, Eric, anything you want to add by way of introduction before we launch in? No, this is a great topic to talk about. It's going to probably take us all down different paths, so it's going to be good. Cool. Well, and I like tangents. So So do I. I like tangents. (laughs) Well, good. So foresight. What is foresight? What is, like, brief overview? Why, as a concept, is it important? All right. So... In the original essay, The Servant is Leader, um, Greenleaf identified foresight as one of the main characteristics. If he he didn't call it that, Larry Spears did once that he dissected Greenleaf's work, but it's really identified as one of the main characteristics of an authentic servant leader. And Greenleaf went so far as to say that a leader who lacks foresight is a failed leader. Um, sometimes we think of foresight as, you know, a a psychic, but it's not. What foresight is, is it's taking your experiences of the past, the knowledge that you've gained throughout the years, coupling them with what's going on in the present and looking to the future to, um, see where you need to go next. So it's one of the building components of vision. But like I said, when it comes to servant leadership, it's, it's one of the, the key characteristics of servant leadership and what makes a genuine servant leader. It's what path do we go down? And it's not a guess and it's not a psychic. Yeah, so when we're talking about foresight, you know, some of the, the words that come to mind, perhaps, well, for me and perhaps for other people, um, fortune telling, seer, prophet, you know, so you have these types of um, terms that are thrown around, um, but we're not, that's not what we're talking about. And we obviously acknowledge that nobody has a crystal ball. Nobody, um, you know, has this, this um, extra sensory ability to actually, you know, see what's going to be happening. But it, it's all about orientation towards the future. Um, mm-hmm. It's, 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 it's orientation of, um, of understanding our past, our present as it feeds into the future. Right. Yes. Uh, and, and understanding the importance of what we're doing today and how it will impact the future. So that's really what we mean by foresight. Uh, and, and it's, we're not even talking about, um, you know, strategic planning per se, though that could be a, a component of, you know, managing with foresight. 
uh, we're not really talking about um, forecasting, really. Um, we're talking about a mindset, an orientation to how we interact with the world and with those around us. Yes. No, that's awesome. That's well said. I love the word orientation, the fact that you use that word, because that, that stands out with me. Um, when, when you look at it from an organizational survival standpoint, it's if we continue to go down, you know, you're floating down a river, all right, and you're starting to see different foliage, you're starting to see changes, you're starting to move faster. Well, if you don't have the foresight of pulling the raft over to the side and maybe hiking down a little bit and realizing that there's like a 300 foot waterfall down the end of this thing, you're going off. Well, that's kind of that, that that's the failed leader mindset. Um, and, and again, you know, when you, when that soothsayer, that, that psychic, that person with a crystal ball, that's, that's, you know, reading your tarot cards and things like that. That's, that's not what foresight is. It's, it really is an authentic behavior and it comes from not ignoring the things that you've experienced in the past and also the, the needs that you feel that the organization is going to have in the future. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's right. I, I think um, it, it's, an, it's an interesting thing because, you know, so many people get caught up in the past and they're ruminating constantly, um, ruminating over the things that didn't go the way they had planned or the way they had hoped, um, the ways they've been slighted, the ways they've been harmed. Um, life is messy. We all have pain. We all, you know, experience those types of things. Some people live in the past and they just ruminate over those things. Other people are, you know, kind of into this whole mindfulness. Let's be in the present. They focus primarily on the present. Uh, and then still other people seem to be always kind of um, looking towards the future. Um, and I'm not sure that any one of those is necessarily worse or better than others. Um, I, I'm of the opinion that it's it's healthy to have a, a, a combination of all three orientations that, you know, we, we, we have a healthy level of um, looking towards the past to learn from the past, to learn from the pain, to learn from the mistakes, to learn from those types of things while being mindful in the present and then having that feed into how we view the future. Uh, and I, I think the danger isn't in the fact that, you know, we, we might find ourselves at different points of time during the day or through our lives, you know, focusing on different areas. That's not necessarily the danger unless we get stuck um, in, in one of those areas. And a lot of leaders, um, it seems to me in my, in my experience in working with leadership that a lot of leaders get stuck. Um, and because they're stuck, they, they don't interact with uh, their people in a forward uh, oriented manner. And it, it causes lots of harms for the organization and, and for the people um, that, that they serve and lead. Uh, ultimately, it doesn't allow for any sort of a long-term orientation that will help them be responsive to the present as it will impact the future with the past in mind and what to learn from, from what they've done. So that's kind of how I, I view that. No, that's good. That's good. Um, I think, I think an example, we can definitely give an example here. Let's talk about academia. We're both academics. Let's talk about, let's talk about academia. Um, and let's look, let's talk about the present situation that we are in as um, a country, as, a, as an environment and, and what um, universities are navigating. So certain universities have been, and not, not the universities themselves, but a lot of your traditional professors have been anti anything but bricks and mortar education, students in classrooms, you standing up in the front delivering a lecture, right? They argue that this is the only way to interact. This is the only way to have a rich experience. This is the way that I did it in the past. And they get stuck in that. And then all of a sudden, Mother Nature's is like, well, here's the plague. And so 
you're left scrambling to try to make up Whereas your more progressive institutions have seen other modalities that they need to take on and cultivated those learning modalities within their existing institutions. And so they developed brilliant online classes, both synchronous and asynchronous. They developed, say, hybrid classes that could immediately just turn a switch off and they can go online because it already has an online presence. And I think foresight, if we look at the last, what would you say, 20 years of education. So if we took it back to 2000, with the exception of the University of Phoenix, and I want to say the University of Maryland, University College, there really weren't any major players that had the foresight to say, hey, this internet thing is going to take off. We need to start coming up with a different modality. We need to start delivering education in a different way because our people are going, our people are going to demand it, right? And so our leadership, or in our case, our faculty, gets stuck in that prior mindset. And again, you have all of these things happen, you know, and you're you're not able to really navigate change to where you now have talks all over um, both the internet and the media where colleges and universities are looking at shutting down. You know, a lot of your traditional liberal arts schools that are gonna charge students 40, 50, 60 grand a year to get an undergraduate degree in pick the subject matter, they're going under because the professor that teaches a 3-3 teaching load isn't going to be able to just stand in front of the class and use the, what were those old, what were those old things that the overhead projectors, remember those with the plastic sheets? And so if you don't have the foresight to see that kind of stuff, all of a sudden when the winds of change happen, your entire organization's existence is threatened. And so that to me is where if you get stuck, like you said, the leaders get stuck. That's a great way of putting it. That's what a lot of universities are, are facing right now is their faculty and their administration get stuck in a way of doing things in the past that they never actually read the tea leaves. They never saw that the traditional university student only makes up about 21% of the student body. So 18 to 22, doesn't work full time, lives on campus, is single. That's 21% at best of the university student. Yeah, yeah, I think with with this specific example, uh, we definitely have a lot of uh, institutional inertia. Um, and so some, some of it is kind of a blatant and willful disregard for recognizing, you know, the trends and the, uh, the disruptive technologies that are influencing the environment that you're that you're discussing in higher ed specifically uh some of it's just institutional organizational inertia right and you're just it's the way it's always been people don't even stop to think is that the way it should be uh it's hard to change policies practices procedure culture uh all of those types of things and so people just continue doing it the way it was uh leaders might be skeptical about you know in this example moving more online faculty might be skeptical about moving more online and it takes some sort of a jumps a disruptive jump start to get to shake people out of you know the the complacency or or the status quo to to get them to the point where they're actually able and willing to look at the situation and understand where things are going i mean within the higher ed space it's not a new phenomenon i mean like you said there's there's been online universities for a while um, and they've been growing like gangbusters for a long time. I think of one that's headquartered out of Utah is Western Governors University. Huge. And I think they have like 150,000 students or something. Um, and, and it's huge. And it's been growing steadily for the last decade and a half. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, people scoff at it and they say, well, you know, that's not a traditional university, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know what? It's accredited. Um, and they cater to working professionals and they have a competency-based model of, of learning and education that seems to be really um, attractive to employers oh, and, yeah. they're, and they're, they're doing really, really well. So, 
Um, so some of it, it really is that blatant disregard. And it seems like I was trying to think while you were talking about when Clayton Christensen's kind of big, big, bold prediction about higher ed came out. It, might, it was probably about a decade ago, maybe a little bit, maybe a little, yeah, a little bit more. Yeah, maybe a little bit more. And he basically said, you know, within the next decade, uh, something like 50% of all the universities are going to cease to exist. It, it, I might be getting that wrong, but something to that effect. Basically, he said there's going to be major disruption, and um, the way we see, know, and understand higher ed today, you know, will not be this way in 10 years. Um, now he's he, not exactly right. I mean, there's definitely been a continual trend towards more online. Um, there's been some consolidation of universe of the university space, um, but it didn't happen as rapidly as he predicted. Um, but now we're in COVID, and I, I don't think he predicted COVID, but uh, he did you know, Clayton Christensen was one of those that had a lot of foresight. And, uh, and he, while he may not have predicted a global pandemic, and while that's the timeline may not have been exactly what he had envisioned, um, we're in a situation now where we see an acceleration towards the online towards, uh, and, and a greater consolidation of the higher ed space, and more universities are going to go out of business or get acquired by other bigger universities. And, you know, so so we are moving in that direction. That he was beating that drum up until last year when he passed away, uh, or I guess earlier this year when he passed away. So it, it's not a new thing, and, and he's just one voice of many who are saying the same thing. And, and so universities have just kind of ignored it, you know. And uh, so so why do we ignore those things when we have experts, when we have professionals out there who who are really good at understanding the trends uh, and they're they're telling us we need to pay attention uh, to this this or this why do organizational leaders who seem to be lacking in their in foresight themselves why aren't they at least leaning on the expertise of those around them who might have that foresight that they can leverage mm. well, <laughs> one i would say is job protection all right, they're afraid to bring somebody else in. Um, ego gets in your way of of bringing an expert in, especially when you're a leader when you're in a leadership position. Um, great leaders allow other people to be the to be strong in the different areas and and to lean on them. And the other one is <laughs> complacency is a warm blanket. You know, it's a, it's it's comfort. It's it's laying on it's laying on the couch under the blanket. You know, nothing good nor bad is going to happen right here. Yeah, right now it's not, but in the future it is. And by the way, that book I wanted to look it up because I think his work was so important. It was 2011. The Innovative University was 2011. Um, I don't know what it is. The other thing, an, another another reason is you actually have to do something. It's like once you acknowledge that there is a problem, okay, once you say there is a problem, you now have a responsibility to do something. It's, oh, we have a pipe leaking in our basement. Well, now you have a responsibility to do something about it. Or it's going to flood your foundation and your house is going to be destroyed. Um, there have been people, Scott Galloway too, he's been going on about this for a couple of years. He's a professor at Stern. I, I freaking love that dude's work. Um, the algebra of happiness, you know, he's been saying this. It's like, you all need to pay attention. You look at, you look at the behemoths of innovation in the United States, essentially those seven companies that are carrying the S and P 500 from falling off a cliff. Every single one of those companies have been innovative as hell with leaders that have unbelievable foresight. They, they can read the tea leaves and say, Hey, this is where we're going in the future. This is what, this is what it's going to be. But traditional academia and a lot of your traditional organizations have had a really hard time with this. They, because you have to take action, you have to bog down. People are fearful. Well, if we do this, we're going to lose our jobs. Or the, my favorite argument, okay, is, well, it's, it's just not as good. Well, that's a load of crap. That's not, that is, that's your, and as, when it, that comes out of like academics mouths, that bothers me a lot. Because when you actually argue against journals worth of, of empirical evidence, 
that say to the contrary, you're dead wrong, and then you don't change, and then a tidal wave of change comes, that almost, it's almost, it's almost as if you, it's not that you lack foresight, it's that your arrogance and your bias got in your way. And arrogance and bias gets in the way of your foresight too, because if you just think that this is perfect and everything is going along just fine, um, you're not going to have the, you're not going to spend the time in your own mind and in reflection to, in order to have that foresight to protect your organization, your agency, and your people in the future. That's, that's going to be gone. And that's what you're seeing right now. You, you are seeing the ramifications of one, not having the foresight, and two, denying the predictions of extremely intelligent people who have been screaming at the top of their lungs for the last two decades that change is coming, right? So even the leaders that are successful with foresight in and of themselves have a hard time getting the, the rank and file to go, oh yeah, we, we do need to shift. So that goes back to what we talked about as far as persuasion a couple of weeks ago. It's are you trusted enough where you can persuade people to move into that direction, to take your foresight, that vision, and to move it into fruition? Because you know who's doing it now and they're playing catch up are the Ivies. You can now do the EDD, I think, in nursing education at Columbia University online. Like this is one of the top schools and top programs in the world. You can go to Harvard Extension School. You can do MBAs at top schools now online. Like who are we kidding? At what point in time? But this, this is, I don't even know if it was a lack of foresight. I could be wrong on this. I don't even know if it was lack of foresight. It could have been, it, I, it really could have been bias. It could have been arrogance and bias that wouldn't allow foresight to even come into play. I don't know yeah. if you agree with that or not. Yeah, well, I, th I think it, at a minimum, it certainly had a role, right? Um, I, I don't see how it couldn't have. Um, yeah, it, it's it's hard to know. It's hard to know exactly why. Um, like again, holding on to the the higher ed example, uh, why it's played out the way it has, um, arrogance, hubris, um, complacency. Um, you know, there's a, we we could probably um, establish a long list of of the types of reasons why um, that was the case. And so what what it really it raises the question for me how how do we uh, help people who might be well step back for a second. Most people don't like change, right? Most people like security, certainty, and they like things to be the way they've been. Oh, yeah. uh, and so a lot of what we're talking about probably comes back to that a bit, just in terms of the psychology of change. Um, so understanding that people, most people don't like change. They're not particularly adaptive. They're not open to it. They have bias against it. Um, how do we help as leaders? How do we develop a greater sense of foresight and how do we help those around us to develop a, a greater sense of foresight? So it definitely starts with that individual as a leader and it's a young person. You don't need to be in some C-suite office or some university president or, you know, a, 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 a city manager. This starts when you're young and it starts with learning an ability to one, Spend time in your own mind and meditation and two reflection. All right. Because those are the, those are the only ways that you can truly cultivate foresight because it is, it's, it, it's in that reboot time of your brain where you're sitting there thinking about maybe a situation in the past. Maybe it was a relationship with a friend. Maybe you go all the way back to high school and it was on a sports team or a committee that you were on. And you think about those experiences and then you reflect on what it is that you've learned in life now. And then you reflect on what could possibly happen in the future. Like how could this come into play? But it really comes down to, to cultivate foresight, the cornerstone, and this is just my argument and I'm kind of a moron. The, the, the argument of it is, mindfulness it's not the not the crystal shop in essential oil 
stuff. I'm talking about sitting there in your own mind, in that meditation, in that reflection, and allowing all of that stuff to come together. Because that is what that is what allows you to navigate the world going forward. We see this in professional responders, in, in seasoned firefighters and police officers and, and, and military operators. They take their knowledge and their education from the past. They couple it with the experiences with they, that they've had in the past, and they're actually able to make split-second decisions under extreme time pressures and consequence, okay? and be successful when they come out on the other side. Well, why? Well, because they cultivated all of that stuff. It, it, it is a foresight. You know something's gonna do this or this. Statistically, there's a chance that this fire is going to do this in this building, and if we go this way, we will be able to cut it off and, and save the structure, or at least save more structures. That's foresight. But that's not learning in the academy. Only part of it is, that's the, that's, the idea that you get that knowledge that comes from academia and vocational training, all this kind of stuff, you couple it with the experiences and you bring those things to life in your operations and the way that you look at the world. And you are also humble enough to say, I have to take the time in order to um, spend time in my own mind in meditation and reflection, even if it's five minutes a day. You know, when you get up in the morning and you pour your first cup of coffee, or if you don't drink coffee, a glass of apple juice, and you just spend five minutes thinking about something, or not thinking about anything and let what comes into your mind. I know that sounds a little bit hokey. It sounds, it sounds a little bit like, um, you know, we should all be sitting on chant rugs and pillows and stuff like that. But I, I promise that's not what it is because it's the only way that you can cultivate this stuff. It's the only way that you can, that you can allow your mind to reboot and that brilliant reflection, that secondary experience that Dewey talked about. That's where that comes in. And every time that you do that, it cultivates your ability to have foresight because the things that are going to come into your head will not come into your head with all of the busyness and the noise and the interruptions that exist in the day right that's that's absolutely right so so yeah if, if people if listeners are into meditation they're into yoga they're into things like that uh prayer whatever um they the great you know do what works for you they, they all kind of serve the same purpose and the, mm -hmm. the the purpose is it's quieting your mind it's taking a step back it's reflecting uh and it's giving you a chance um to 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 have those ideas come to you uh and and it's, it's just so important, uh, whether that's taking a walk out in nature, walking your dogs, you know, there's lots of different ways people can cultivate that, but we need to find those opportunities. Uh, otherwise, we're just, our, there's too much stuff bumbling around in our heads, and we can never get past the urgent uh, that we're facing today or the ruminations of what went wrong yesterday. And, it's, and we just don't have time. We don't have the ability to, to think in the future. Um, another, well, it's not a specific example, but I was, I was interviewing another, um, podcast guest earlier this week, and she brought up something that was super insightful. I thought, um, that demonstrated a lot of foresight and I was simultaneously really pleased because it was a great discussion and I appreciated her pushing on my thinking and helping me to, to think of something in a new way. But I was also simultaneously kind of upset with myself because she brought up something that makes so much sense that I had almost given zero thought to <laughs> previously, you know? And so, and I, I think I tend to be someone who does a lot of reflection. I, I tend to think a lot about um, the future uh, in, the re in relations to work and trends and, and all sorts of things. And she brought up something quite compelling that I hadn't hardly considered. Um, so it, it just, again, made me think about like, what are my biases? How do, what, how am I like getting stuck into my comfort level of like what I think I know and what I think I understand, uh, and what blind spots do I have because of that, um, that won't allow me to, to prepare for the future, uh, in ways that I probably should. And, and the, the specific thing that she was talking about was in relation to, uh, COVID-19 and, how so many employers are now 
getting more comfortable with virtual work. So many employees are getting more comfortable with virtual work. But one of the potential unintended consequences of all of that, while there's a lot of benefits to it, is that in the long term, it could negatively impact organizational succession planning. It could Im negatively impact um, younger employees, millennial Gen Z employees that are at early career stages that need kind of the informal mentoring and coaching that occurs organically, just as you're like bounce, like the, the organic um, uh, interactions that you have in the workplace where you just, you, know, you share an elevator with someone and you chat for a minute, or you're just attending a meeting and observing, or, or um, just the discussions around the water cooler, just those little interactions that happen that you are able to pick up things about the culture, about the politics, uh, about you know, professionalism, uh, and all of that is kind of gone now, right? Um, it, and virtual work can work really great for project-based work, um, and we can utilize the technologies, but it's hard to manufacture the organic um, opportunities that just arise in the work in the physical workspace, right? And that's something I hadn't really thought a whole lot about. And she's right. Like that, that could potentially, if organizational leaders aren't thinking about it, that could potentially have very serious ramifications for um, leadership pipelines and organizations in years to come. So, you know, our that's not our topic today, but I, just an example of. How I, you know, I like to think of myself as someone who tries to think quite a bit about the future, and that's something I hadn't really considered. So we all have our blind spots, we all have our biases, and we all can get stuck pretty easily uh, if we're not continually challenging our thinking, if we're not continually challenging our perception of the world, and surrounding ourselves with other people who challenge us too. Um, and one of the reasons why leaders get caught up you know, in their echo chamber and their bubble is because they surround themselves with people who are like them, who think like them, who um, act like them. Um, and it's not even on purpose, but it just kind of, that's human nature and we, we tend to do that. And so we have to really proactively uh, try to push ourselves out of our comfort zone and push ourselves to sur be sur you know, surrounded and put in situations where we're both maybe uncomfortable, but also have the opportunity to have people push on our thinking and, and kind of force us to to consider new things, new ways of understanding the world. Yeah. Again, that goes back to ego, right? One of the things that I know is your personal strength, you, John, um, is you do like to surround yourself with people who are smart. And you like to surround yourself with people who can um, disagree with you. And that you can also lean on in different areas of expertise, which is a huge strength of leadership. Um, going back to what you said about the COVID-19 thing, I never thought about that either. It's like that is, that's brilliant foresight, man. That's exactly what that is. That, that individual showed brilliant foresight just talking about that. Yeah, because teaching from home and researching from home and writing from home and even mentoring students over Zoom or MSN, MS Teams or something like that. Yeah, it's you're not getting that interaction with people in the office anymore and helping them develop their interpersonal skills that make a great leader, that make a great manager. Is that's the one yeah, I never thought about that because when you're at home, like I'm focused on very specific things at home. I'm focused on my teaching and my scholarship and my like I'm focused on it. Um doing service through the virtual realm. But I'm not focused on, hey, who would be the next person that you would want to, you know, start to cultivate into taking, say, a chair's position or going on and being a director somewhere? I never thought about that at all. That's the reason why you surround yourself with people who are smarter than you, because they're the one and that have different opinions, too. That's the other thing, because all of that plays into foresight. It's their foresight. And then that helps you make a decision. If they know where the landmines are buried, they can even tell you, hey, let's not walk down that path. We need to go this way. I never thought about that. That's, a, that's true. I don't think the answer, I also don't think the answer is 100% online education either, especially with young people. We know that like 18-year-olds don't do well. They don't. Fresh out of high school, freshman in college, if you put them in a 100% online program, chan their chances of being successful are 
not nil, but they're pretty close. And it's because they haven't developed the adulting time management skills yet. And that self-discipline of actually following a schedule and getting in there and doing things. They don't have that. We see that with young people all the way down in the, the especially the, the elementary school levels, they don't do well with the online. And it's because they need those interpersonal skills that only come from being together. No, that's a great topic to bring up for foresight, especially in our environment right now, because I think a lot of businesses are going, well, why the hell am I paying 45 grand a month to lease this space when I can just buy you all MacBooks and pay your internet and you go home? Yeah, right. Yeah, and so the point is, you know, in, in relation to our discussion today, is there's lots of things like that, right? That Tons, we, yeah. we, we just haven't thought about yet. We haven't considered yet. <clears throat> and so it comes back to ego. It comes back to our discussion about humility. Um, if, if, you, if you're a leader and you feel like you have it figured out, um, then that's, that's the first step in the trap, right? Um, yep. y- you, you, have to, you have to assume that there's a whole bunch of stuff that you just don't know or understand yet. And that you're continually pushing towards that understanding um, by surrounding yourself with with smart people, by um, challenging your thinking, and, and those sorts of things. And so, there there are particular, I think, mechanisms that you can put in place to help with that. Um, I can't remember if we mentioned this previously when we were talking about humility, um, but one one thing you can do is is like in meetings, you can simply uh, assign someone to be the contrarian, uh, assign a role in the meeting to say, okay, this week, you're the person, everything I say, you need to push back on. Um, that's, you know, a lot, especially in a, a kind of a passive aggressive culture, um, as is common yeah. here, here in Utah, yeah. that's something that people aren't comfortable with. And so, so you get a lot of people who just kind of nod and say yes, when you're in a meeting, even though they have different opinions, and they're not willing to speak up. And so trying to establish a culture where people realize it's safe to share different opinions you know, can be powerful, um, but it's hard to disrupt the pattern, you know? And so this, I, I know one particular leader who just assigned someone to, to, to be the person who pushes back in meetings and it rotates. It's not the same person every time. And that way they can make sure that, that there's at least some critical dialogue that's happening, but it takes a level of security um, and self-awareness as a leader to recognize the need for that. And to be willing to do that and put yourself in a position where people are openly challenging you um, because a lot of leaders actually want the opposite they want they don't want people open, openly challenging them they just want people to to uh, agree kind of take their marching orders and move on um, comply and compliance like we've talked about before so you know we we need to find those ways to disrupt that um, some of it comes through you know just interacting with like getting outside your bubble and interacting with people who aren't like you or the people that you would normally associate with. Um, you can, that can happen in formal ways, you know, where you go to events or you go to conferences or whatever you, but you can, you know, uh, it can happen more informally too. And as long as you're open to discuss discussion and engagement with other people, um, you know, one of the things that I think has been really great this summer, as I've been interviewing a lot of people for the podcast, because I've just been exposed to a lot of really great thinking and a lot of great ideas, and that's been awesome. Um, but you don't have to do a podcast um, or interview people uh, to get that. Uh, as long there's there's TED talks, there's I mean there's there's almost infinite amount of content out there um, that can help you stretch your thinking in, uh, in whatever area of specialty you're in or in whatever um, you know topic that interests you. And so as long as we're kind of of the mindset that we need to continually be engaged in lifelong learning and that we don't know everything and that we, we, we need to stretch our thinking um, and that there's still like way more yet to discover uh, com- as compared to what we already know and understand. If we can have that cultivate that mindset, then we're going to be in much better shape to, to have more of a uh, foresight mentality and uh, be in a position uh, to be ref- reflexive, adaptive, uh, and, and uh, be able to pivot when, when serious things are happening in the world around us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, what is that Bruce Lee 
uh, be like water, fill the, fill the water can fill the space. And yeah. I like the term pivot too. So do you ever read Sheehan? One of my favorite organizational behavior people is Sheehan out of MIT. And it was um, organizational behavior and culture. And he, he did that. I think it's one of the best OB books around, but he talked about uh, uh, both digital and um, uh, Sibagagi and how uh, they, uh, how there was a, a group that when an engineer came forward with an idea or something like that, like they would bring in the group and it was just, it was just, it was just a game of pig pile at that point is they wanted they wanted to come in it's kind of like a dissertation defense where you are going to get drilled from every direction before your committee's even willing to sign off on this because they have to play that what if that's why when you said play the role of the contrarian well the devil's advocate you know that's a that's a good thing but in order to do that you have to be able to check your ego that's a good leader that can do that that can say listen i want you to come in and i want you to shoot holes but you also have to have an organizational culture established where people aren't practicing self-preservation. Meaning, if I speak up, can I still pay for my kids' health care? You know, you have to have that culture. But it goes back to building the servant leadership culture, what we talk about every week. If you establish a culture that's built on trust and love and humility and empowerment and all this kind of stuff, it is easy to do something like that. Because your people know, hey, you're not bringing me in so I embarrass myself and then you have a reason to terminate me next year. Um, you're bringing me in because we want to know that whatever the decisions that are being made, whatever the ideas are, the steps, is we want to see what you said, what you called blind spots. And that's, that's brilliant. That's brilliant leadership. That's, that's brilliant leadership 101. Because the decisions you make they could be that free puppy decision. It's that cute little wet nosed puppy in that box out in front of a Walmart and you and your kids walk in and they ask for that little wet nosed puppy and you're like, yeah, we're going to take it. It's free. Of course it is. But that damn dog is going to cost you thousands of dollars a year and it's going to live for the next 20 years. You know, so it'd be nice if somebody else was walking beside you going, are you sure you want to get that dog? It's going to cost you thousands of dollars a year and it's going to live for the next 20 years. So that little emotional commitment, i.e. that idea that you have as a leader, unless it's been tested up against somebody else that's willing to tell truth to power, mm, you have no foresight on that one. And of course, we all grab that cute little wet nose puppy and we take it home. <laughs> right? I was going to say, we have two of those puppies <laughs> right? in our house. <laughs> right? Yeah, you get that stray kitten. Of course, it's a good idea. It's going to bring you happiness. But you know what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well... Yeah, this this is a, a fascinating topic. I think, you know, circling back, you, you were just mentioning about uh, how it intersects again with servant leadership. Um, I really believe that it's it's impossible to be a leader um, that cultivates that kind of a, a culture that you were just describing without being people centric, without being a servant leader. And if you're not developing that culture, you simply won't have an organization that's going to be responsive. Um, to to the, the different um, uh, external pressures and whatnot, um, but not even responsive. You know, you know, we're we're talking about something more than being responsive, but some uh, an organization that can try to um, to be prepared for the future and and look towards the future for um, how they can better serve their customers, how they can better serve their people. Um, that's what it, it just requires servant leadership to be able to do that. And, uh, and I appreciate the discussion today around foresight and helping us to, to think through and better understand how maybe we can cultivate that in ourselves and with the people in our organizations to have a healthier people-centric organization. Uh, any, any last words you want to share on this topic? No, I liked how you finished that up. That, that put the cherry on top. That's Wonderful. Good. Okay. Well, thank you, Eric. It was a pleasure talking with you again. Um, I, I look forward to doing this again next week. And I hope uh, the listeners will go back and listen to all of the, the episodes in the series that are scattered throughout the seasons, um, as I think they're, they're particularly important um, to uh, effective leadership. Uh, certainly, Eric and I believe that. So 
I hope today has been helpful and I hope everyone stays healthy and safe. Have a wonderful week. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.